Robert Bresson may very well be the only auteur. That is, he is among very few filmmakers who developed a specific filmic style that he stuck to throughout his filmmaking career. His films featured ascetic qualities to them, like how the actors in his films would deliver their lines dryly, with no emotion to them. He believed that the kind of acting seen in films during his time was theatrical, which is fine for a theater setting, but antithetical to the kind of acting cinema should portray. After his second feature, The Ladies of the Bois du Boulon, he swore never to use professional actors again, since to him, they were so programmed to act theatrically that he could not use them in his films. He viewed theatrical depiction of emotions on screen as inauthentic, which instead of revealing the actor's interior, masked it with a poor imitation of the human spirit. Brisson wanted his actors, which he called models, to act robotically because by doing so, it would reveal their true essence, their soul. Brisson wrote in his only published work, Notes on the Cinematographer, Model, thrown into the physical action. His voice, starting from even syllables, takes on automatically the inflections and modulations proper to his true nature. Brisson notoriously shot dozens and dozens of takes specifically to break down his models and make them perform as mechanically and emotionless as possible, because he believed that only in this mechanical repetition would their interior be shown. Brisson was raised Catholic, and most if not all of his films contain Christian themes, but his relationship with his faith is certainly complicated and unique to him. His relationship to his faith and God took many different, often contradictory forms throughout his life, but in a 1973 interview conducted by Ronald Heyman, he said, There is a feeling that God is everywhere, and the more I live, the more I see that in nature, in the country. When I see a tree, I see that God exists. I try to catch and convey the idea that we have a soul, and that the soul is in contact with God. That's the first thing I want to get in my films. Understanding this part of Brisson's personal philosophy is the key to reading his films, as it explains his obsession with finding the soul in his models. There is no purely visual way of depicting a person's soul in film, as the medium's limitations make it so that it can only capture what is visible. This is why he focused on capturing the idea of God in the soul, so that his audience would feel like they've experienced God at the everyday in his films, without necessarily him explicitly showing God to them. In the same way that he was able to show the soul of man, through his model's detached performances, in his early films, Brisson was able to show his characters finding divine grace, in the Christian theological sense. Diary of a Country Priest follows a psychologically tortured, sickly priest as he struggles to preach to the town of Ambercourt. He has his own crises of faith in the film, which make it very difficult for him to assist the townspeople, although not for a lack of trying. At the end of the film, it is revealed that his sickness was stomach cancer, on his deathbed, he finally comes to terms with his inner conflicts, and dies being absolved of sin and with a restored faith in God. The priest's journey to finding grace was a long and painful one, but he was able to reach a state of grace just before dying. In Pickpocket, Michel leads a life of sin. He steals not out of a need, but instead out of an ideological desire to do so. His friend Jeanne attempts to convince him to change his ways but he refuses to do so. He leaves France to escape the police, only to come back a few years later after he spent all of his money on liquor and prostitutes. Michelle tries to work to support Jean and her child, but he ends up being tempted to pickpocket again. When he is caught and sent to prison, he once again encounters Jean and says, Oh Jean, pour aller jusqu'à toi, quel drôle de chemin il m'a fallu prendre. He finally sees the error in his ways, and reaches a state of grace through his redemption. What Diary of a Country Priest and Pickpocket have in common is that their protagonists are able to find grace on Earth. Both the priest and Michel are flawed characters, but they each have an arc and find redemption at the end of their stories. However, with the release of Alhazard Balthazar, there came to be a darker turn in how Brisson's films ended. The donkey Balthazar goes through several owners in the French village where the film takes place in. Some of these owners are kind, but most of them treat him horribly, beating and torturing him oftentimes for no reason. 
Balthazar keeps doing his duty, until eventually he is taken back by a sadistic youth named Gerard, so he could be used for a smuggling operation. Balthazar is shot in the crossfire between Gerard's gang and the border guards. He lays down in the field surrounded by sheep and dies. On the surface, this seems like a horrible, sad end for Balthazar, as he never did anything against his many masters' wishes, but all he got in return was a violent, painful death. The reality for Balthazar, however, is that he would have never found happiness on Earth. The world depicted in Alhazard Balthazar is a terrible, decrepit place to live in, where modern advancements have only led to more suffering. The only way for Balthazar to find grace in this world is through death. Robert Brisson's later films show a consistent inability to find grace on Earth. Due to modernity, specifically the advancement of technology leading to a worse world, and the disillusionment with traditional Christian values, grace has been removed from everyday life, and the only way to find grace is through death, most commonly through suicide. This is best seen in three of Brisson's films featuring suicide, Mouchette, A Gentle Woman, and The Devil, Probably. Modernity's discontents seem to be a common theme throughout Brisson's later films. In Alhazard Balthazar, this is often shown in the contrast between the remaining elements of pre-modern life and its inevitable replacement with modern life. Near the beginning of the film, Marie and her father are riding in a cart pulled by Balthazar, when Gerard and his gang approach. Gerard calls the donkey modern in order to make fun of Marie and her father's farm life. The gang is riding on motorcycles themselves, which is a contrast to the relatively quaint way Marie is getting around. As the car rides out of the frame, the gang stops and looks at a car passing by. This hints to the fact that the lifestyle Marie's father so desperately wants to hang on to will inevitably be rendered obsolete. Her father is a stubborn man. He refuses to modernize his farm, which leads to financial and legal trouble. The reality is, there is no room in the world of Alhazard Baltazar for a pre-modern man like him. At the same time, however, the modern man as depicted in this world is someone without morals, without any kind of noble heart. The youth, represented by the gang, but more specifically Gerard, are shown as sadistic and selfish. Gerard has embraced modernity with his near fetishization of his motorcycle and his trips to the city. He treats Marie terribly and abuses Balthazar throughout the whole film. It would be simplistic to blame the evil shown in the film solely on Gerard and his gang, however as it is more likely that Brisson uses Gerard's despicability to instead highlight how it is impossible to be a moral figure in this modern society. At the beginning of The Devil Probably, Charles and his group of friends enter a gathering of young anarchists. Je proclame la destruction. This anarchist group does not seem to follow much of an ideology besides pure destruction. The world to them is beyond saving, and even without any definite plan, it seems like destruction would be more favorable to the current state of the world. Charles and his friends reject this idea of anarchy and leave. Charles does not find any solace in this political group. He may very well agree with them that the world is unsalvageable, but turning to destruction is not something that appeals to him. The film reveals more about Charles's mental state later on. He is unable to find a place in the world and nothing seems to bring him any happiness. No ideology or activity will be able to help him. Charles's friends, Alberté and Michel, are climate activists. After the encounter with the anarchists, we see them watching footage of pollution and environmental destruction. Alberté and Charles begin sleeping with each other, and Alberté recommends that Charles join them to help pursue pro-environmental causes. Charles goes with Michel to protest against deforestation, but nothing much comes out of this protest. Charles tells Michel that it is pointless to advocate for saving the environment, because ultimately it is up to the scientists to save it, and there is nothing they can do as individuals to make an impact. Later, Charles and Michel board a bus and begin talking about how the world governments are at fault for the inevitable climate collapse. The government has been short. Don't accuse the government. In the world at the moment, no person, no government can be able to govern. Ce sont les masses qui régissent les événements. Des forces obscures dont il est parfaitement impossible de connaître les lois. 
C'est vrai que quelque chose nous pousse contre ce que nous sommes. Il faut marcher, marcher. On marche contre pas celui qui on se pète toujours. Qui est-ce donc qui s'amuse à tourner en dérision l'humanité Oui, qui nous manœuvre en douche Le diable, probablement. A man on the bus says not to blame the governments, as the real fault comes from the masses who follow systems such as capitalism, the root cause of the environmental collapse, to continue to control them. Modernity has led to these complex sociopolitical systems to become autonomous. The people at the top who control the world only have so much influence, and they cannot be singularly responsible for climate change. It is in fact the systems themselves, and all the people who live in them and perpetuate them, who are responsible. Modernity and its systems of control have doomed humanity to an early extinction. The critique of modernity and la raison is a little bit more specific and tangible, but it also tackles more broad topics such as late-stage capitalism. As the title of the film suggests, la raison is about money and greed. It also shows how every person living in a capitalist society is intoxicated with this greed to a certain extent, or will be if they haven't been already. The film expresses these ideas by using a forged 500 franc note. The counterfeit money is used by two rich teenage boys in order to buy a picture frame. When the store owner finds out the money is fake, instead of getting rid of it, he uses it to pay Yvonne, a store worker. The owner could have paid Yvonne using real money, but the greed gets to him. Yvonne uses the fake money to pay for a restaurant bill, where he is caught and arrested. The fake note traveling between different owners shows how greed is a symptom of the capitalist system, both in the world of the film and in our world. Greed is not an individual's personal problem, nor the problem of a select group of people, but it is instead systemic. It leads to the innocent, like Yvonne, being taken advantage of, as the system encourages this kind of behavior. Yvonne loses his job and is forced to become a getaway driver in order to make ends meet. He ends up arrested and his family breaks apart. After three years, he is released from prison, and the first night outside he decides to murder and rob the owners of a hotel named, by no coincidence, Hotel Modern. Later, he meets a merciful old lady who takes him in and offers him food and shelter. She understands the risks of taking in a murderer, but she chooses to help him anyway. Out of greed, Yvonne murders her and her family, and steals their money. Later at a cafe, he confesses to the murders, possibly due to guilt, possibly because he is tired of running, and is promptly arrested. When Yvonne first meets the old lady, there is a strange sense that he's fated to kill her and steal her money, despite Yvonne's personal feelings, and possibly despite even his own greed. When the murder scene plays out, he seems to be going through the motions of murder, instead of killing out of joy like he claimed to when talking to the old lady earlier. This is because, while it is ultimately his decision to murder and steal, he is coerced into doing so by his late-stage capitalist society. Modernity's capitalism has corrupted him, turning him into a greedy monster just so he can function within its society. By turning himself in immediately after the crime, however, there is a sense that he is trying to break capitalism's corrupting influence on him. It is unclear how much of his violent actions are due to his own evil decisions, or are because he is forced to do so under the system, but one thing is made very clear in La Région. A modern society which functions off of greed is not a good one to live in. According to Bresson's later films, modernity has doomed the world. Violence and evil are everywhere, as complex, intangible systems control our everyday lives and prevent us from enacting any kind of meaningful change to make our lives better. It is tempting to write off this period of Brisson's work as purely nihilistic, but that would be neglecting to consider a very important part of Brisson's work in philosophy. As stated earlier, Brisson said that he sees God in the everyday, and he wants this aspect of his philosophy to be a significant part in his work. In notes from the cinematographer, he wrote, In this language of images, one must lose completely the notion of image. The images must exclude the idea of the image. It was impossible for Bresson to visually show God or grace in his films, because there was no way of visually depicting these things in a way that would be satisfying to Bresson himself. What is in the image, to Bresson, is much more than what is just seen. This is why one cannot see the souls of his models. 
one can feel them through their stilted performances. God and grace are present in these supposedly nihilistic films, but just not on the visual surface. For Brisson, there is no hope left on Earth, but that doesn't mean that there is no hope left for humanity. Human beings can still find grace. They can still find salvation and a spot for themselves in the kingdom of heaven. However, due to modernity and the evils it brings, it is impossible to find grace on Earth. Therefore, the only way to do so is in death, and specifically in the films Mouchette, A Gentle Woman, and The Devil Probably, and Suicide. Like in Alhazard Balthazar, the world of Mouchette is shown to be a miserable, decrepit place. The film follows the titular character Mouchette, a teenage girl who is treated poorly by her parents, her classmates, and the townsfolk for no real reason. Mouchette is innocent, free of sin like the donkey Balthazar, and yet the world is making her suffer despite this. While alone in the woods, she finds an epileptic man named Arsène, who wants to use her as an alibi because he thinks he killed a man named Matthew. She wants to help him, likely because she empathizes with him due to his condition. She believes that the world is working against Arsène in the same way that the world is working against her. Despite her intentions to help him, Arsène ends up raping her. After this traumatic incident, she receives absolutely no sympathy from the villagers in her town. In fact, they continuously berate her, and accuse her of fornicating with Arsène. She ends up defending Arsène when it is revealed that Matthew is still alive, and reveals to no one that she was raped. It is likely that even if she did accuse Arsène of rape, the villagers would still continue to disparage her, and even blame her for being raped. The only person who shows her any kind of sympathy is an elderly woman, who gives her clothes and fabric to cover her deceased mother. But even she is condescending towards Mouchette, which causes Mouchette to snap back at her. She stands her ground for the first time here. At the end of the film, she encounters hunters shooting rabbits. She sees one that is shot and writhing on the ground, and runs up to it, but it's too late. The rabbit becomes motionless and dies. The rabbits are innocent, free of sin like Mouchette, and yet, like her, are treated terribly and abused. Mouchette realizes that there is no good in this world. There is nothing in this world worth saving. She rolls down a hill into a creek, drowning herself. Mouchette is a girl free from sin. She is innocent and pure, and she has done nothing to deserve the terrible things that happened to her throughout the film. While there is no hope for her on earth, there is some hope for her in heaven. After she kills herself, the main theme of the film begins to play. It is the last movement of Vespers by Claudio Monteverdi, named Magnificant. It was a musical setting dedicated to Pope Paul V. The high pitch of, these, of this last movement seems to contradict the tone of the final shot, as it depicts a horrible suicide. Brisson is using Magnificat here to show that Mouchette has found grace in her death, something that she would have never have been able to find had she been alive on Earth. Her suffering on Earth was pointless, so she killed herself in order to find a place in the Kingdom of Heaven. The film Mouchette ends with a suicide, and a gentle woman opens with one. Elle, the woman the film's title refers to, has just jumped out of her balcony, completely surprising her husband Luke. The rest of the film tracks Elle and Luke's relationship, first being passionate, but soon taking a darker turn. They never seem to understand each other, and Luke's jealousy over Elle prevents them from coming any closer together. She attempts to cheat on him, likely purely to hurt Luke and not out of any sexual desire, but is instead caught by him. Luke never confronts her about this, nor does he confront her when she points a gun at him while he's sleeping, but to punish her, he kicks her out of his bed and orders a small bed just for her. Suddenly, Elle becomes sick, causing Luke to pity her and to spend more time together. They go cro closer through this, much closer than they ever have before, and Elle swears fidelity to him. Je serai pour vous une femme fidèle. Je vous respecterai. Elle kills herself soon after this, which confuses Luke as he thought that their relationship was going better than it ever was before. Elle doesn't commit suicide out of being discontent with the world, nor because she hates Luke. In fact, she does so because she ends up loving Luke. 
She knows that if she were to stay alive, their relationship would be hell due to Luke's jealousy. But she loves him despite this. She wants to stay faithful to him, and to be a good wife to him. But it is impossible to do so due to Luke and their rocky relationship. By killing herself, she forever remains faithful to him in heaven and reaches grace. Before she dies, she reaches into a drawer and touches a crucifix. This crucifix has a special meaning for her, as it was one of the things she pawned to Luke when they first met. The crucifix here takes a double meaning, first as a token of remembrance for their relationship, and second as an object of faith that inspires her to stay faithful to her husband by killing herself. At the end of The Devil Probably, Charles pays one of his friends to kill him, as he says that committing suicide is against Christian doctrine. There is nothing left on earth for Charles. He is surrounded by a horrible world, and nobody is able to help him. Not the psychologist he visits, not his friends, not his romantic partner, nobody. There is no good left in this world either. Modernity and its complex systems have left the environment in a terrible, unsalvageable state, and the systems responsible for it are too big and abstract for any individual or group of people to change them meaningfully. The only hope left for Charles is finding grace in heaven. Charles doesn't choose to die purely out of depression and being hopeless. If that was the case, he would have just killed himself. Choosing to make his friend kill him instead shows that Charles still has faith in God, and he has hope in his salvation. It is just that this salvation will not be able to be found on Earth. The later films in Brisson's career have a specific focus on the evils of modernity and depicting death, especially depicting suicide. While it seems like they have become completely nihilistic, the reality couldn't be further from the truth. Brisson's characters have the ability to find grace in suicide or death, where they will be saved by entering the kingdom of heaven. Monsieur Bresson, tout d'abord, je voulais dire que je trouve votre film absolument admirable de bout en bout. Mais euh, une question tout de même. Dans, dans tous vos autres films, il y avait à un moment un élément, je dirais, d'espoir. Oui. Peut-être amené par la musique, par exemple. Ici... Merci. Non, 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 pas de musique. Non, enfin, pas uniquement par la musique, mais quelque oui. chose qui faisait qu'on pouvait se raccrocher. Oui. Il me semble qu'ici, on, on ne peut se raccrocher à rien. Et on en sort avec une impression à la fois de plénitude et de désespoir. D'abord, il n'y a pas d'espoir sans désespoir. Et là, le désespoir peut aller... peut et doit aller très loin pour que l'espoir puisse se sentir. C'est-à-dire, plus l'espoir est grand, plus le désespoir a été lourd et, et terrible.